Hi, this is Natasha Breyer, ASC. I'm the director of photography for the movie Honey Boy, and you're listening to the Go Creative Show. Hey everyone, my name is Ben Consoli. I am a director and owner of BC Media Productions. This is the Go Creative Show, the show dedicated to creative professionals and filmmakers. Today we invite Natasha Breyer on the show to talk about her work on the film Honey Boy. Natasha was the director of photography of Honey Boy and joins us today to talk about her unique cinematography techniques and so much more. The Go Creative Show is supported by Post Lab, stress-free collaboration for Final Cut Pro and Rule Boston Camera. Buy, rent, create at rule.com. I had so much fun talking to Natasha Breyer and watching her film, Honey Boy. I absolutely loved it. It was one of those movies that it just you just got completely captivated by it. It drew you in, it looked incredible, the acting was great, it just had such a unique feeling to it. And we talk a lot about that with Natasha and how she achieved that in her cinematography. She also is going to share some information about what she does to her lenses. This is gonna blow you your minds, and I don't wanna give it away right here, but she's gonna talk about a unique way that she treats her lenses that you guys will never expect. And that is all coming up in just a couple of minutes. But I want to bring your attention to our social media pages because here's what we got going on. We're going to try a few new things this year with Go Creative Show. One, we're considering putting out uh, some merchandise. We've never done that before and I think it would be really fun. Um, the other thing is we're considering perhaps doing a Go Creative road show, um, visiting some of the key filmmaking cities around the country, bringing guests on, doing a live Go Creative Show. Would love to know your thoughts on that. If you guys would like to have a Go Creative show in your city, please let us know. Let us know. Engage with us on social media. Write us a message. Let us know what you think and where we should go and what guests we should have. Um, we're getting very excited about this. It's something that we really, really want to do. But do you want us to do it? That's the most important thing. So head over to GoCreativeShow.com, and there you can sign up for our mailing list, you can subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast app, and this you should be doing because it's the best way to make sure that you get all the episodes and you never miss one. Why would you want to miss one? And it also shows you where we are on social media so you can engage with us, you can ask audience questions to our guests, and now let us know what cities you'd like for us to go to. So check it all out at gocreativeshow.com. All right, let's jump in, shall we? We've got a great interview coming up with the director of photography for Honey Boy, Natasha Breyer. So I'm here with Natasha Breyer. She is the director of photography for Honey Boy and a whole bunch of other things too. Your portfolio is fantastic. And I'm so excited to have you on Go Creative Show. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. You must be so excited. What a great film this is. How has the reaction been? It's been really amazing. I mean, people love the movie, but also, which is the most um, goose bumping aspect of it, um, it seems to have a profound effect on a lot of people. Uh, I wouldn't say like a healing effect because that would be like a, a bit exaggerated, but it's yeah. really... Um, it's been really moving to hear people's responses on how it had helped them to think about, you know, their daddy issues or some family issues from a different perspective and kind of, you know, work through their own shit and have their own insights and revelations. And it's, it's interesting because the, you know, the process of the movie had so much to do with therapy. And so it was yeah. a therapeutic process for Shia and for all of us to shoot the movie and it's really magic to see how the therapeutic aspect of it, it also continues to happen once the movie reaches the audience. Um, I don't think um, I was aware of, you know, that the movie could have that power. Uh, of mm. course, we're always making movies that resonate with us in some deep place of our soul. And at least that's what I'm doing with the movies I choose and always trying to do something that, um, touches me very deeply and I guess somehow, you know, has to do with my growing experience as a human and as an artist. And, and so I guess like every, every movie you do, you do believe that there's 
some kind of transformational process for the filmmakers and also for the audience that is going to receive it. But just, I think, I think just what is surprising about this movie is just the degree, you know, the degree of how deep is resonating with people and people are going to see it like two, three, four times. And um, it's, I don't know. We always talked about it as a psychomagic act when we film it. I thought, in, we, we said, you know, if Shia went and talked to Jodorowsky, he would go and tell him, OK, go and do a movie where you're playing your father so you can understand him and forgive him and yeah. liberate yourself from us. So we always kind of, you know, not joke about it, but we kind of, you know, we, we use that, you know, we're always saying like, yeah, we're kind of this, we're doing this kind of psychomagic act. And what is really amazing is to see, you know, that that, that psychomagic or whatever it's called that we did, um, also continues, you know? And, and, and what could be more magic than that, you know? That people are not only watching the movie and really resonating with it and loving it, but also somehow is helping a lot of people, you know, to deal with their own shit. Uh, for me, it's, it's a dream, you know, to to have that effect with a movie. It's So the movie is about a young actor who... Um, you know, is who's, you know, struggling, he's reconciling with his father, dealing with his mental health issues. But it's basically a young child star, now an adult, who is struggling with alcoholism, um, gets into a car accident, ends up going to therapy, ends up going to a rehab, and cannot leave without facing jail time. And this is a story of him kind of trying to deal with the his PTSD um, from having a, an abusive father. Um, and the story kind of plays in the present. Well, the story, not the present, but the story plays in 2005 and then also like in the early 90s. And um, it's about Shia LaBeouf's life. You know, um, we're not using their names, but it is about their life. And Shia is a screenplay. He wrote the screenplay. And it's it's an interesting choice to me that they didn't, it, it's not necessarily like an autobiographical movie because we're not using their real names, but it is very much clearly about his life. Um, what was the strategy behind that? What do you think? What do you mean about strategy? Why did he decided not to put his name when? Yeah. Like why, why not go all the way and have it be, have their actual names be there R rather than just using the story, just have it be, you know, not a documentary, but having it be like more direct that this is his life as a child and an adult. You know, I, I think this is more a question for Shia. I actually never asked that question to him or to Alma, so I don't have the answer. Um, but I would say that, you know, I think a lot of movies, um, you know, all, all the directors that I normally work with are are very kind of personal directors, you know, like our house directors that tell personal stories that touch them, but they're not necessarily their stories. And when they are, they always fictionalize them. And so you end up creating a new character that is very based on reality, but it's not really the reality. You know, like, for example, Gloria Bell, my previous film that I did with Sebastian Lelio, uh, the character of Gloria was very inspired on, on Sebastian's mother. But then, of course, as a filmmaker, he needs to make the story more interesting and more filmic. So he changes a lot of stuff. So I think when you're talking with filmmakers that, you know, tell like, do personal work with meaningful stories I think there's always a degree of autobiographical even you could say for Alma to do this film it's not her story but yeah. the reason why she resonates with uh, with Shia and ends up directing this movie is because she's also herself the daughter of an alcoholic that was abusive you know what I mean mm. so I, I don't know I, I think it you know every, every fiction film um, has uh, you know a, a a degree of autobiographical of course this one is very much like probably 99 percent you know and yes it would have made sense since we're all talking in public about this being completely based in his life in his yeah. father uh, it would have made total sense but i i don't know it might have to do with the creative process for shia the moment that he you know, I, he started writing some scenes as part of his therapy and he was not re really writing it as a script. He was just writing it as part of his therapy and I guess like, you know, revisiting like traumatic moments of his life for the PTS syndrome. 
Um, and then somehow he shared that with Alma and Alma made him see that there was a movie there and then he continued to write it in a more of a script form. And I don't know, maybe it was part of his creative process that he needed to have a bit of distance and, and give it a different name. I'm really not sure. I, I don't think I can answer that question. Well, the movie's awesome. I mean, the acting is great. Excellent directing. Cinematography. I mean, your work on it is stunning. I, I really, really liked what you did. Um, and I want to talk about it a little bit more. So, you know, when you approach a, a, a movie like this, that is so honest, that's so raw, um, you know, that is you know, so personal. How do you prepare for that visually? I think all the stories that I chose in my career are very personal and they resonate with me in a very deep level. And that's why I really choose to shoot them. And that's why I don't shoot films so often, you know, because sometimes it takes one whole year or sometimes two years to to find a movie that really touches me in that way where I feel yeah. like I really need to tell this story. Um, and, you know, I'm, I always try to keep a lot of integrity with that and, and, and really only do those movies that really call me in that very strong way. Um, so in a way you could say that it's, it's more of what I've been doing all my life. On the other hand, this movie was very particular because since the first moment I got the script and I met Alma, I knew that it was not only a very personal movie, but it was actually part of a therapeutic process that was still ongoing. Um, both my parents are actually Freudian psychoanalysts. So, oh, wow. Yeah. It's not that exotic in Argentina, actually, because everyone goes to the shrink or is a shrink. Really? But... It's very exotic. That's interesting. I, I've never heard that before. Yes, yes. Buenos Aires is really like a Woody Allen movie. Really? Yeah, we are we are crazy. Um, Why do you think that is? It's in, that's interesting to me because I mean, in the U.S., people more and more obviously are getting comfortable with the idea of going to therapy. But I still think a lot of people feel, you know, I, I, I think, I think there is oftentimes the perception, especially in older generations, that going to therapy is could be embarrassing or is a sign that you are weak. Um, and I think, yeah, largely that's changing, especially with younger people, but I still do think that there's a stigma there. And it's interesting that it isn't like that where you are. In fact, it's the opposite. That's I've never heard that before. Well, you know, not to enter into a whole other political subject, but, you know, pharmaceutical companies are very, very powerful in this country and they're not interested in people really dealing uh, deeply with the origin of their symptoms and their real trauma and to mm. take in antidepressants or any other product that they design uh, to get people medicated. So there's a lot of campaign, you know, that's been going on forever to, you know, try to, um, you know, not, not, how you say, not promote uh, things like psychotherapy and just promote, you know, taking pills and, and more like psychiatric um, solutions to problems. So I think it has a lot to do with, with that, you know, like, um, mm. you know, it's like in the same way that how much alternative medicine you have in different countries, you know, again, it all depends on the lobbies and the power of pharmaceutical companies, but that's, yeah, that's like a whole other conversation. <laughs> um, but being raised in a country where everyone is so conscious and, you know, aware of a lot of, kind of psychoanalytical terms and concepts and working on themselves and being the daughter of two shrinks where, you know, therapy has always been a big part of my life and in, in my family vocabulary every day. Um, I was really attracted to the script, you know, and the project when I heard about it. And, you know, the idea of portraying uh, a therapeutic uh, process on film was attractive and also the idea of somehow not just portraying it, but like really capture it because it's still ongoing. Like I could totally understand when I got the project, um, how cathartic uh, and how much of a part of his therapy was to write it. But I could anticipate and see how transforming it was going to be for him to play the father, you know, and get on the skin of the father. And I could see how challenging that that was going to be for him. And, um, so how do you prepare for something like that? That was your question, right? Coming back to the question. So 
I, as a filmmaker, you know, I could see, you know, what we were, you know, and I had conversations with Alma and, you know, I could see that from a filmmaker point of view, we were going to try to capture this process in a very honest and real and raw way uh, that ha- somehow resonates with what Alma's done in her previous work, which was documentary and was really respectful and empathetic and loving towards her characters. So I could see that our camera approach was going to go in that direction. Um and then the lighting would be more cinematic, you know, the lighting would be more what I I can do in feature films and and so support all these emotions, you know, through a more expressive lighting, not a documentary or like a, you know, 360 degrees lighting so that, you know, the characters have all the freedom, the actors have all this freedom to move around and do their stuff. Like the the challenge was going to be like how to how can we have both? How can we let them to be free and move around? Um, It's interesting to hear you say that because I do, it felt very much like a documentary in the way that it was shot. It felt like a lot of handheld. You were really in the moments. I really felt like I was watching a real thing happening. Yeah, and Um, you were because a lot of it was very real, you know? (laughs) So that, 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 that was the main challenge uh, of this movie you know like how how do we find a style a language and, and a shooting system so that we can capture that reality and we can be as little invasive as possible and you know let them act and play like what shy is doing is is acting but it's also channeling and role playing and and yeah. it's very delicate so how do we let them the space to be very free to do all that without an invasive film crew doing what we normally do and at the same time get a cinematic look with the lighting, you know, and not just have a flat lighting that it's covering for every possibility. So that was my biggest challenge. But also it was more than just give it, give the actress freedom, which I've done in other films. You know, I also shot a film more than 10 years ago with Shane Meadows called Summerstown. And Shane also works with a lot of improvisation with actors and that's the priority and you just have to light you know, a little bit 360 uh, and just, you know, that's prioritize that, you know? Um, So, but here there was an extra element, which was um, the therapeutic element. So I, it was more urgent not to be invasive and really let them free to move wherever they want, but also uh, not, you know, not have anyone like coming and making adjustments between takes and things like that. Because, Um, There was also the therapeutic aspect of things. So what I'm saying is like um, once once Shia is acting in some very sensitive scenes, especially in the room with the kid, um, you just cannot get in there in in that room. You know, it's you, you, you have to be really respectful that this actor is also going to through a process, an internal process that is a lot more than method acting. And you want to give him a container of safety and protect him and really give him that room, you know? This message is for all of you Final Cut Pro 10 users. Like me and everybody here at BC Media Productions, we love Final Cut Pro, um, but it could be better in one area, and that's collaboration. Now, you've always been able to collaborate with Final Cut Pro, but there's never been a really super seamless collaboration tool until now. Have you guys heard of PostLab? PostLab. No? Yes? Well, you're hearing about it now, and you're going to absolutely love it. Because PostLab is a collaboration tool for Final Cut Pro 10, and it enables users to share libraries, to track and save changes, and make sure that no more than one person is working on the same library simultaneously. So that means zero conflicts, plus you get a recallable history for your project. Now, PostLab is the best of both both worlds. It's a cloud service uh, built on a cloud that is custom made for Final Cut Pro 10 libraries. It's made for it. And it's also a desktop app, which is great because PostLab always works off your local copy. So you work with it just like you've you know, been using Final Cut Pro forever. So there's, there's no change in your workflow 
All this does is add an extra layer of um, collaboration ability that you guys are absolutely going to want to have. I'm, I swear, once you use PostLab, once you're going to say, this is the workflow that I have been waiting for. And the good news is you get to get it for three months for free by going to gocreativeshow.com forward slash postlab. Now check this out, guys. Three months. Think of how many projects you'll do in three months. And you get it for free at gocreativeshow forward slash postlab. Well, let's break, let's break this down a little bit because you had just mentioned that the two challenges that you were facing or two of the challenges. One was creating a, a shooting style that would allow the talent to, or allow, you know, allow the actors to perform uncumbered and not being bothered by the crew. And then you also said that the challenge was doing that, but also creating a cinematic look. I'd love to kind of break that down. Let's start with giving them the, um, you know, stage per se, to allow them to have these performances without being, you know, and without having crew intruding on them. So what? How how did you make up your crew? What was your camera department like for this? The, the first the first thing I really had to do to prepare for this movie was to find the right crew, and find a a group of people that were going to be not only great technicians, which you need to pull off a you know movie with very little budget that it shoots in nineteen days originally. Um, how how you're gonna find the people that you know they're gonna be able to pull this off? Like no time, no equipment. Very, I mean, very little time, very little equipment. Challenging. How much time did you have? We originally we had 19 days. Then we had some some stuff with insurance with a roll rig that broke, so we got like uh, two days extra. Wow! So like three weeks. I think we we yeah we ended up with 21 days. Um, <sighs> wow. So, you know, I had to find a crew that can pull this off, which, you know, I've done, in, this movie was 3.5 million. Uh, you know, I've done just before Gloria Bell for five, and that was already very challenging, you know, to do movies with that scale in, in LA. Yeah. And my crew, most of them couldn't really follow me to Honey Boy because they just had finished another low budget movie. So normally I do commercials, you know, in between so that, you know, they get some money and then they can follow me to my art house next project that I, yeah, yeah. you know, I always choose from all the options. I always choose the one with less money, but it's because it's usually the most interesting for me artistically. Um, and I try, try to follow that. And luckily, you know, I have the commercials to balance it, but this was just straight away from Gloria. So most of my guys were like, I'm sorry, I can't do it. You know, I have the kids in college and all of that. So I had to find a new crew that I could, I could guarantee that they were able to pull this off in the, in the level of the, you know, their professionalism and experience, but also that there would be people that would be sensitive enough to understand the, you know, the degree of vulnerability that we were playing with in some of the scenes with Shia and really, uh, you know, be able to hold that space, you know, like emotionally, psychologically, spiritually <laughs> advanced people that, you know, it, it's going to understand that this is not going to be a normal set and a normal process. And we're going to have to, you know, be very careful and sometimes tiptoe around the actors like you would do in a film with a lot of, you know, sex scenes, for example, right? You have to yeah. protect their privacy. So, well, first I had to, you know, go on and, you know, meet new people and cast a group of amazing people that I found. So when I got, when I got that crew, I was like, okay, I think I can go on this journey with these people. I think they, they get it and they're going to, you know, take care of Shia and, you know, make sure that we have the right environment, the right atmosphere to create this container of safety. That was the first thing. And then once I had that, I was like, okay, we are obviously going to have a camera that is handheld is, you know, kind of capturing without, manipulating without anticipating, without asking people to go specific areas or marks or anything. So it will have the spirit of, you know, more of a documentary like Alma's previous, you know, work. Mm. Uh, so she was very comfortable doing it that way. She was very comfortable that way. I mean, that's, you know, she's really good at that. I mean, that's, that's kind of what she's been doing. And I guess that's why Shia also chose her because he, he can see a filmmaker that you know, has captured, you know, very human stories in a documentary format, but at the same time, making them very poetic and visual and cinematic. So, and that's why I fell in love with her and her work, you know, so the camera was like pretty clear. Okay. We're just 
you know, it was just a matter of finding an operator that has, you know, the same sensibility than us. And we had an operator that was amazing, Matias Mesa, who was doing uh, the Steadicam work and also most of the handheld work. There was only a few scenes that me or Alma operated. And sometimes when we had two cameras, you know, we would either Alma or I would operate the second camera. And a couple of times we had a, another operator. Uh, but yeah, it was a matter of finding somebody with that sensibility and then just creating that working method, you know, where we would just let the actors do it and we just capture it instead of yeah. trying to to control it a lot, you know. But then with the lighting, uh, you know, your typical approach as a cinematographer would be like, well, I just have to light for 360. So you would just light with practicals and, you know, have like a kind of safe lighting where you make sure that if they end up in any corner of the room that you will be able to see their eyes. But luckily, um, you know, we're in, we were in 2018 and we had, you know, technology like LEDs and like wireless control. So what I did was I, I um, replaced all, all the light bulbs in my practice. I mean, I carefully designed and chose you know, the positioning and the quality of the practical lights with the production designer, JC Molina, who is amazing. And so we started strategically um, put different practical lights in different corners of the room that would cover, you know, the different areas uh, with some interesting lighting. And then those um, practicals were all LED and they were all wire wireless wirelessly connected to to a dimmer board that I had by the monitor. So, um, Oh, wow. So you were controlling them. You're sitting by the monitor. You have a little control station there. Yeah. It was like, like a live, live lighting, you know, like you would do in a concert or something. Oh, wow. I call it like DJing, you know? So that's cool. I was in my monitor. I, I have a set of headsets that I use to communicate with all my crew. So I could communicate with the operator with the headsets and give him direction and especially when you had two people, you know, and two cameras, which we did for some of the scenes with him and, and the kid in the room. Not all of them, because the room was tiny, but when we could. Um, and uh, so I would just see, you know, we'd normally just get them to rehearse. I mean, we'll just film the first rehearsal, you know. Sometimes we had great stuff, even on that first take. And, and then we'll do different takes, and they'll try different things. And the thing was... Even if we did have a dialogue that was written by Sha and they were following following it quite, you know, um, precisely. Um, what we could never know is what we were going to do, what Shia was going to do in the space, because he's an actor that really uses the space in the room. And he doesn't stay still. So we couldn't really anticipate, oh, they're going to have this conversation like sitting on the, on the bed, you know. The thing is, this character... Um, never wants to stay in that room because he doesn't want to be there. He doesn't want to be paid by his own son to do this. And so yeah. he's always like about to leave somehow. You know, he's always on the threshold, on the door frame, or sitting outside, or coming in and out. And 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 this kid is always feeling like he can't reach. You know, like the father is emotionally unavailable and he can leave any moment, and he can't like retain him. So that's the whole dynamic. And. And Shia was really good at using the space to create that tension all the time, which meant that he was moving around all the time in the room and I could never predict where he was going to go. And we definitely didn't want to tell him where to go or give him any limitations because that would be ruining the, the whole amazing thing that he's doing. Yeah. Um, so Basically, I had all these strategic corners with stuff, and then I would just see where what he does and where he goes. And uh, while we're shooting, I will just slowly, you know, surreptitiously, I don't know if that's the right word in English, I would like dim one light down and bring the other one up and just play like a DJ, really. It was more like a jamming session. That would be the best analogy, you know? That sounds so fun. Was he consistent at all, or was he different in every take? Uh, you know... He's very professional. Like he's been there, you know, since he was eight or something. So he yeah. really understands about filmmaking. So he he can be very consistent, like, you know, whatever. If he's smoking a cigarette, you know, he will put it off always at the same time and, you know, do things that, you know, like 
he will have it, even if he's going through all this stuff at the same time that is a lot more than acting, he will still be very conscious of the mechanics of filming a movie and aware. So he will do things to help everyone out, you know, including the script supervisor or, you know, eventually the editing of the movie. But at the same time, he's trying different stuff, you know, because we're shooting from the first rehearsal and, and things are evolving organically with the dynamics with him and Noah. So it's also very natural and expectable that it's not going to be consistent and there's going to be different things going on. That's, that's the nature of the beast. That's what we wanted. That's what we captured. And that's why the film feels so alive, because we're giving them on purpose the freedom to not be consistent. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that makes sense because Shia's character playing basically his father, working with Noah, um, who is the actor playing Otis, which is Shia's uh, child self around, you know, 12 years old or so. Um, like you said, you know, Shia's father is always on the brink of a breakdown, really, but always on the brink of leaving. Like he's always panicked. It's never relaxed. It's always uh, frantic. And there's a ton of moving around. And um, you really do. It's interesting to hear that you just kind of created a 360 set, let him go and just followed. Um, but my question is, did you set up any like large key soft source or anything? Or was everything truly just practicals in the room? It was everything was practicals in the room. And then there's a little bit of light that is coming from outside when you have the daylight scenes. You know, we had eyebrows and yeah. soft boxes of, you know, to have like soft light pushing in from the windows. And at night, I'm, I'm kind of replicating the effect of the red neon and the, you know, the greenish kind of mercury street light that you have outside in the main yeah. window. And then the little window by the bathroom, it's getting a little bit of that pink from the neon on the, on the pool area, um, which we did, you know, with some sky panels and Sputniks. Um, so there is some stuff from, from the, from the outside coming in as well, but during the night scenes, they're really lit by the practicals. The, the outside is just like a little bit of an effect, you know, on the curtains, but it doesn't really light the scene. Um, so, yeah, and it, it's it, the film didn't look particularly dark. Like I wouldn't, I didn't watch it saying like, oh, they took a very dark approach to it. It just looked incredibly natural. Like everything just looked so real. That's why I'm saying like it. It felt so much like a documentary. It was. It was really wild. Well, we, we, we try to be very natural uh, because we, it was important that it feels real. You know, I think that's yeah. the power of the movie, that it is real and you don't want to destroy that. So but at the same time, for it to feel natural as it is uh, and also expressive and, you know, it's not dark, but it's also not brightly lit. You know, it has a lot of shadows and contrast. Um, there was a lot of work behind it because, you know, as you know, natural doesn't mean that it looks like the way it looks. And, you know, we had to shoot a lot of the scenes with the kid during the day because, you know, he had to leave at 10 p.m. and we were shooting in the summer. So we only had like one hour and a half of night every night. Wow. Okay. Um, so sometimes we had to tent the room and make it look night, you know, when it was the day. But then Shia will still open the door and want to go out because it makes sense for his, his character. So we always had to find ways to, you know, um, find solutions so that, you know, we could still get all that freedom, even though we were shooting at the wrong time of the day. Like there's like a very long scene, which is like the first time they come into the motel room, uh, which takes, you know, I don't know, like it's like three scenes, you know, they're in the room, then they go to the laundry, they, they come back to the room. And all yeah. of that is at dusk because it's when they came back from set, you know, they were riding in the motorcycle with, you know, late afternoon sun. And then you have like, you know, I don't know, 15 minutes of scenes uh, that are in the magic hour. And of course, we didn't have that time. So that was challenging, you know, to shoot the, the interior of the room in the middle of the day, but still with a door opening open and Shia going in and out of that door. And, you know, and we had to make it work somehow and we had to make it look like late afternoon. Uh, but we couldn't say, hey, just close the door and stay inside the room because we're not doing a theater play and we don't want to limit him. And the fact that he opens the door and sits half in and half out, which is the most tricky lighting situation <laughs> you can have in a room, especially when you're not supposed to see outside, um, it's actually 
the absolute best decision for the drama and for the dynamics between the characters, because that's when you need to establish the first time they're in that room. And the father is actually sitting outside next to his motorcycle and he can leave in any second, you know? Are you the type of person that will always be on the side of story in those situations? Or do you ever like fight for the cinematography and say, I know it makes sense for the story, but please don't open the door. <laughs> like, Does it ever get to that point? You know, I think um, the more mature you get as a cinematographer, uh, of course, you always try to fight for those fights. And in every normal movie, you would say, you know, can we make the action like next to this window? Because we are going to have much better light. But you, more or less, you kind of define that when you're scouting and you choose your locations and you make sure you do it in a clever way so that you're going to end up with good lighting, even if you have to do cross coverage, you know. Um, but um, there's there's always some situations where the best, the thing that is best for the scene is not the best for the most beautiful cinematography. And then you have a challenge. And I think as a, as you grow up and become more mature as a cinematographer, uh, you can see the value of what the director needs and you're not going to fight for the better lighting. You're just going to take it as a challenge and say, okay, now as a cinematographer, how can I go around this challenge, give my director and my actors what's the best for the drama? Because at the end of the day, that's what is the most important thing that you do the best dramaturgy that you can do. That's your job as a cinematographer as well, not just to do beautiful lighting. And how do I get, how do I do the best possible lighting for this setup, you know, for this circumstance, for this situation, um, favoring, you know, what is the priority, which is always, you know, what's, what's better for the scene as from a miss and same point of view, you know, what's going to, was going to support the, the emotions that you want to convey in that scene. And sometimes that doesn't go together with the best position for the best lighting. But that's, that's when you have to be more imaginative and push your boundaries and, and find a, a different solution. And sometimes from those situations comes great stuff. You know, it's just not what you were thinking, you know, as, as your first idea. Uh, but that's the magic of it, you know. It, I think if, if you would just do films where... You're putting always the actors in the right positions to have the best lighting. Uh, yeah, you'll have beautiful looking films, but they will not be as real and as alive. Um, and then what's the point? You know, we're, we're, we're telling stories about people and we want to tell them in, in the most compelling way that engages the audience and makes them feel what, you know, what they're supposed to feel. We don't, don't want to do just beautiful images. You know, you can do photography or commercials if you just care about a beautiful frame with beautiful lighting. There is still so much more interview to go with uh, Natasha Breyer, and um, we're going to get there, but I want to quickly talk to you about Rule Boston Camera. Now, Rule Boston Camera is the place to go to purchase and rent all of your production equipment. Because think about it, production is mission critical. It really is. I mean, there's so much money and time and effort being put into your production days. And you want to make sure that the equipment that you're renting is, first of all, in good working shape. Uh, second, that you know how to use it, right? And third, that you have a production partner that has your back. So if anything goes wrong, they've got you covered. That's what Rule Boston Camera is all about. They have a world-class inventory of cameras, audio, lighting, grip gear, communications, dynamics, everything you want. Lenses. Of course, huge selection of lenses. Everything you want is there. They've been in business for nearly 40 years, and you can imagine what they've got there in their warehouse. Uh, but they also have amazing service. They are your production partner. They make sure you understand the equipment when you leave. They've got, they give you technical guidance the whole way through, and they're committed to supporting you while you have their equipment. They are just as committed to your project as you are. And I know just saying that is easy, but believe me, I've been using them for what, 15 years now. These guys are the best. And that's why when big, huge, uh, you know, big, huge movies and commercials come through Boston, they use Rule 2 because they know what's up, right? So check them out for yourself and experience the Rule way at rule.com, R-U-L-E dot com. Can you tell me a little bit more about the camera and lens package that you chose for the film and why? 
So we chose Alexa Mini. Uh, I when I shoot digital, uh, Alexa is always my choice. I I, I I feel like it's the digital camera that has managed to get uh, the most kind of filmic looking um, gamma. Mm-hmm. And um, and Mini, of course, was you know the no brainer decision since all of the movies either handheld or Steadicam. And we shot with a set of Crystal Express anamorphic lenses. They are very old lenses designed. Oh, I've never heard of those. What are they called? I want to look them up. They are called Crystal Express. Um, they were designed by Joe Danton um, in the 70s when he was at Panavision. Um, Crystal Express. Yes. Oh, they're cooks. Inside, there are all cooks, S2s and S3s. And then the external... Uh, element is a uh, Japanese glass that was made by this Japanese man that died, so they cannot make any more. <laughs> uh, so there's wow. only a few sets in the world. They, you know, they used to belong to, you know, to Joe, then to Panavision, then Joe sold his company again to Panavision. So now Panavision has most of the sets, and there's, you know, I think that I I only know of like three or four sets. Uh, in the world, I think we have two in America, one in England. There's one in Italy, but you cannot get it out of the country. Um, and that's kind of about it, unless you go directly to to Joe. Uh, and there, what are the qualities of the lenses that really intrigue? You know, that you thought were perfect for this film? Yeah, they are. They are very beautiful because they have this cook kind of soft quality and and an organic quality to them. Uh, but on an anamorphic version. And to me, they have this kind of dreamy quality a little bit. You know, they do like, they have a beautiful bouquet and they do beautiful flares. And it's like a very kind of pictoric image in a way. And something that was really important in this movie was also to create a time space that was a little bit out of reality because we're mixing, um, you know, seam- seamless, how do you say, seamlessly? Seamlessly, yeah between the present uh, and the past. So it's like in between, you know, well, the present, calling it the 90s, you know, the, ad- the adult bodies, um, which you could say is between, you know, uh, reality and memory. But we're also on the space of dreams, you know, and the space of revisiting things in therapy. So everything for me as, in, as a cinematographer is really like a, a different kind of time space that is, let's say, like inside Shia's head in a way right yeah and i wanted to 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 have some some palette that in a way it doesn't do a clear distinction about what's what's present what's memory what's dream what's you know revisiting in therapy and somehow blends everything together so the movie has its own you know time space uh and it can jump between all these things without showing you a sign that is like, and now we're going back to the flashback. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I actually found that really interesting and refreshing in a way because you you definitely know where you are in the movie. You know what you're looking at. You know you're looking at young Shia, old Shia, that you, you get it. Um, but it doesn't have the normal, or not necessarily normal, but does it have the typical tricks to make you, to really make sure the audience understands what time period we're in. And that, you know, one is the past, one is the present. It was all very cohesive. I mean, we're in 2019. The audience is very smart. You know, they see a, a, that the, the kid is the kid and then the adult is an adult. They don't need a different texture to show you that you went to the past. So, yeah. we're, you know, we're, we're assuming that our audience is intelligent and doesn't need those uh, artifacts. And, and so we want to create, you know, a language that is really emotional. So, you you use emotion to go from present to past, you know, from adult to childhood to, you know, from whatever the space of rehab to the space of memory. And and I, I thought it was really interesting that that's yeah, that that you know, that that we we're, we're we're giving everything a special texture that is a little bit dreamy, a little bit romanticized, is very realistic, but at the same time it has something a little bit magical. And so that permeates everything. And then it gives like the whole, the whole film, that kind of otherworldliness, you know, other kind of language that is really like the language of emotions, you know, and, and of processing emotions for me, at least. 
And so these lenses have that magical stuff, which, you know, it just, it just adds that, that little subliminal touch of magic to things. And, and also because they have this filmic look and I was also playing with, you know, I, I paint on the lenses on the filters and I send like, you know, flares to the material that I paint with and stuff. So I was creating all these very subtle little things that are giving it a kind of... What, what do you mean you paint on the lenses? What do you mean? Yeah, I just paint with some, with brushes and different substances so that I... Oh, so you're, you're, you're actually adding something, adding, you know, material to the lens, to the glass. Yes, because I, I feel like in digital, everything is, even if you are choosing, you know, old and amorphic lenses like this case, I still feel like sometimes things are too clean and there's no room for, you know, any chemical or, you know, physical accidents and aberrations. And I feel the, always like, because I grew up with film, I, I feel like I miss that, that if things are too clean. So I try to mess it up a little bit. And in this case, even more, because for me, my memories of childhood, which is different than Chaya, because I'm a bit older than him, but my memories of childhood are super eight stuff. It's, you know, probably for Chaya is VHS, if they ever. Sure, it, yeah. Right? Um, but, you know, I come from a generation where when you think about memory, you know, you're thinking about, you know, childhood, like late seventies, beginning of the eighties, you think like a little bit like magenta, inky images, or, you know, um, some kind of uh, burnt edges and like grain and, you know, all yeah. Polaroid stuff. So for me, that's how, what I feel as memory texture. And it was the same thing for Alma, who's got my same age. So we also wanted some subliminal touch of that again nothing is like really like oh they went for the you know 70s look also we can't because his childhood is in the 90s but just that kind of like old oldish memory like kind of romanticized idealized memory what were you putting on the lens i have like a you know a whole you know set of five suitcases with different materials different powders and liquids and glitters and things like that so every no time way. It's something different yeah if other cinematographers are doing this no one has ever mentioned this on the show they've certainly mentioned filters or having lenses you know tweaked at at the manufacturer at you know panavision or whatever but i've never heard anybody say they actually apply you know, stuff directly to the glass. That's interesting. Yeah, I haven't heard it either. And every commercial or film I go into set, people are like, what are you doing? <laughs> and they, they, it's, it's really fun, especially in the commercials, which is such a fast turnover. And, you know, I do a lot of them all over the world. And people are like, what? She's doing what? And then they're like, oh, okay. Now we have to like, you know, just before we roll, she's going to go and paint, you know, and then the first AD has you know, incorporates the painting moment into his vocabulary and stuff. I don't know why more people are not doing it. I, I found that for me, um, you know, when I did Neon Demon, it was the first movie I did in, in digital. And it was kind of my film school for digital. I, yeah. I had done a lot of commercials on digital, but, uh, you know, it's different on commercials. And in this movie, I really wanted to get a look that was as filmic as possible because it was about beauty and, you know, all these things. So I had to experiment a lot and Nicholas was very open for me to experiment and try stuff. And the more I tried, the more he encouraged me to be bolder and try even more. So I started to paint a little bit with the, you know, with the grease of my forehead, which is what the old cinematographers, you know, were doing a long time ago. So you just like rub your forehead with a brush and put it right on? Well, at the beginning, I was just doing it with my finger, you know? And so you do it and it's like this kind of like blurry effect in specific areas of the frame. And wow. the demon was, everything was almost static shots. So it was, very, it was very easy to paint and say, oh, I just wanted to focus that window a little bit, you know? And I was just like painting with that. Oh my God. I want to do this now on, on everything. <laughs> yeah, you should try it. So, you know, then I just continued to do it and then I started to, you know, perfect the technique. Well, does anybody, I mean, is there ever pushback from the studio or the director where, I mean, it's so permanent and, you know, in this day and age when you can do so much in color and in post to do something so permanent is risky. Everything I do is permanent and everything I do is risky. If you look at my movies, there's always very strong um, decisions, not only on the framings, but on color and lighting 
And, you know, all, all the movies I've done in my career, you know, they tend to have moments where are very, very dark and they have also very specific color palettes. And since the Neon Demon, I, I, I kind of discover my more wild side with color. Uh, before, I think I was always having very controlled color palettes, but the colors were more subdued. And, and, and now it's like I'm, it's more like a kind of feast of color sometimes. Uh, but, you know, because I come from the film world, um, everything we were doing on film was also irreversible. You know, I started shooting short films and my first movies before even digital intermediates. So you had to do everything on camera, you know, and I was always doing extreme decisions anyway. Um, so there was never, you know, never a way back. And I think just, you know, when people hire me, they look at my body of work and they, they like that, um, that boldness as well, you know, and that, that personality. And, and so they, they wouldn't want me to give them, um, a negative or you could say now a file that they can then alter and change and go in different directions. They want me to put my signature on it. And I would not take a project unless I feel that I can do that. So, uh, I think now more than ever, because you can do so much on post, for cinematographers uh, like me, which is a lot of the people around, I mean, all the people that I admire and respect, you know, we all do the same. The same. We do our strong choices on camera in a way that we make sure that they cannot be undone uh, or they can be undone as little as possible because there's so much range now that it's really tricky also to keep having so much control as you had before. Um, but, you know, what's the point of filmmaking if you're just not going to be brave with your choices and do things afterwards? I, I totally don't believe in that. I think then you end up with something halfway, uh, you know, and I've just never been interested in that kind of establishment filmmaking. So I'm choosing directors that are, you know, very visual and very confident and, and brave and they don't, they have no, um, insecurity or fear of failure and they can make those strong decisions on set and they can allow me to make those strong decisions on, on set and, and trust that they're fine you know that, that just go with it and we don't need the safety of oh well let's make sure we can do it later if in six months time we feel like it was too much no like we're here now like this is what we're deciding you know i i want to work with that kind of people and that's you know that's the kind of directors are i'm choosing the people that you know gives me the freedom to do that the opening scene is packed with a ton of quick shots and quick scenes. There's a car accident. There's movie sets. There's, there's so much action in that opening scene. Um, I'm curious from your standpoint, how much did you actually shoot? Like, were you sitting there doing full scenes or were you only shooting for the edit, which was uh, very quick and very bold? I thought the, the editing in this film is fantastic. Um, and it's unique. It's different. It's a different way of storytelling. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's really really good, and we actually have a, que a question from Twitter that sort of is on this theme. So I'll ask it. Brady Betzel asks uh, first says great movie, which I agree. Um, I'm curious how they planned shoots for edit with so many fast forward rewinds and real time scenes happening simultaneously. Did they shoot each scene as they could, or did they shoot in a specific order? So uh, we're relatively asking kind of the same thing with so much quick cuts with so. Um, you know, strong in edit. How were you shooting to accommodate? Well, you know, you don't, you, we knew that, you know, a lot of those scenes were going to be part of the montage. So we, we didn't need to shoot full scenes, but of course we shot longer than that. You know, it's like when you shoot a music video, right. And you just run a situation for, you know, for the whole song and then you're going to take bits of it. So, you know, we'll just run the situation. Like, I don't know, for example, when he gets in that train uh, set, you know, with the Nazis and he's like fighting with these guys, we just shoot him, you know, from being outside and finishing a cigarette, going into the set, coming inside, getting, you know, with all these kind of train effect lights and, and start to fight with these guys. So maybe the whole shot, the whole scene took like a minute to shoot. And then in the edit, you know, Alma would take like, you know, some parts of it to construct it and intercut it with other stuff. You know, when he's like running away, you know, on that tunnel, like running away from prison with the kid, we also just shot the whole thing, you know, coming down and then walking along all that tube, you know, all that tunnel, 
and we shot it on his face with a kid and then we shot it from behind so you can see the steady cam guy and we just did like the whole run and we know that you know each shot on each direction took like 15 or 20 seconds and we know that you know we're not going to use all of that but yeah. we just were collecting the material you know for for the montage well, the movie is absolutely fantastic. It's really, really great. If you guys have not seen it, I strongly suggest that you do. And check out, um, you know, Natasha's entire ta uh, catalog. Neon Demon is a great film. I mean, you got a cover of American Cinematographer for it and Vanity Fair for it. <laughs> and uh, it, I mean, really excellent. And you were kind of the very beginning, uh, you sort of ushered in this new age of neon lights and, um, you know, hard angles and really bold color choices. I mean, that became, and still largely is a very popular look. And it, you know, you were really there at the forefront doing it with neon demon. And uh, I don't know if it gets enough credit for kind of ushering in that, but here you're going to get your credit. That's for sure. Thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to put all the links of course, to your websites and uh, social media on go creative show. So you guys can check her out for yourself. But Natasha, thank you so much for being on. Um, I really appreciate it. And I can't wait to see what you do next. Awesome. Thank you. It was so, so much fun to talk to you about it. Thank you. All right. I want to thank Natasha Breyer for coming on the show and sharing her experience with us. Go see Honey Boy if you haven't yet already. And if you have, go see it again. Why not? Her work is phenomenal, and you guys can, of course, check it out at her website and her social media, and we will have a link to all of that in the show notes for this episode. I also want to thank Matt Russell for mixing and mastering and making the show sound so good. You can find him at gainstructure.com, gainstructure, and on Twitter at gainstructure. Of course, our producer, Connor Crosby, who's out there grinding it out every day looking for new guests. Uh, you can find him at ignitionvisuals.com, ignitionvisuals.com. And of course, head over to gocreativeshow.com, follow us on social media, um, subscribe to us in your favorite podcast app, and sign our mailing list because there is so much happening, and we want you to be the first to know about it. Of course, we got to thank our sponsors too, Rule Boston Camera and Post Lab. Without these people, the show wouldn't exist, so please support those that support us, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye.